Good morning, meditators. We're going to begin in about six minutes here and start with our guided meditation and a reading from Seneca from Letters from a Stoic. Thanks for joining us. Settle on in and make yourself comfortable.
good morning, meditators. Ah. Uh, <laughs> nothing's working! Good morning. Oh, Off to a little bit of a rough start this morning. Just a little bit. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to uh, another morning of guided meditation. Today is July 29th. God, July is almost done and over. Kiss you goodbye. It's going to be the last day on Sunday. And then we're starting August, which is like this. It always feels like this massive inertia into fall. It just all just come colliding into fall we're getting there hey good morning Miro happy time zones to you happy Friday evening I believe or afternoon you're probably more towards the late mid afternoon I think oh, if my memory and ability to process time zones is correct I don't know if I'm going to be able to process very much this morning. I did not get hardly any sleep last night. Like, I stayed up with my son. We were playing video games for a while. And then I went to bed, slept for a couple hours. And then, like, I was turning off, off and on and off and on. And then finally I go at 4.30 in the morning. I just couldn't take it. I was like awake, wide awake. I was like, oh my God, brain, stop. And so I went down here into the studio space and, and I started working on guitar tone and working on um, just rehearsing stuff for the Dark Side of the Moon project or the Dark Side of the Moon experience and... Yeah, I was just like, fine. But I eventually pulled the plug on that about 5.30, and I was like, all right, let's go back. Try and go back to bed. Slept for a couple of hours. Now I feel like I could sleep another four. That's the brain for you. Well, this morning's guided meditation is going to be something unique uh, for us. We're going to be doing something a little different we're going to be having a different object of focus tonight or this morning or this evening this afternoon wherever you are so normally we focus on our breathing or we focus on the music and i should say we're still going to have the same focus but um it's going to be altered a little bit and the object of the 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 meditation is different so this morning um, when the meditation mu music begins we'll just continue our s the slow deep breathing that we normally do just long inhales through your nose and long not forced at all exhales through your mouth just really <sighs> but what we're going to do is I want you to think about a point or a time in your life um when you felt like you were at your worst or doesn't well it doesn't have to be your worst could even just be just a time when you felt really awful about yourself maybe about some choices you made or some things you said to the wrong people or the wrong things you said to the right people or whatever find a time that you just that once in a while troubles you and comes back and goes hey remember me remember this episode in your life I get those now and then. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to picture and visualize that moment in our life. And then all I want us to do is in whatever way feels most natural, visualize you with yourself your modern day self your current present self with your then self and showing compassion showing kindness showing love and forgiveness and empathy for that moment in time in your life the purpose of this is to try and experience 
self-love and self-forgiveness for the things, something that might have happened in the past, something that you might have done in the past. So it's all really this is. So it's a chance to dig into a little bit of your past and be kind and compassionate to yourself. So that is our focus this morning. We're going to use our breathing to keep us grounded, keep us centered. So keep the deep breaths in and out throughout the meditation. And we'll be giving ourselves kindness and compassion for our past. And then after our meditation this morning, we're going to um, be reading from Seneca's letter from a Stoic. I think we are on letter number seven. At some point here, I'm going to have to start translating, getting these Roman numerals translated because it reaches a point where like, oh, I don't know what number that is. LXXXVI. <laughs> or CIV. Is that is that a thing? CIV? It is a thing. I'm, I'm not fluent in my Roman numerals. All right, friends. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's get ourselves in a comfortable place. Um, make sure that you won't be disturbed. Maybe uh, silence your phone or shut off the notifications on your computer. And I want you to sit comfortably, but nice and straight. Sitting as if you're the best version of yourself, relaxing your shoulders, let them hang low. Don't bunch up, don't shrug your shoulders, just keep them nice and low and loose. Take inventory of your face, your facial muscles like your, uh, your brow, your cheeks, your chin, your jaw. Let all that just hang and relax. And why don't you just gently close your eyes and we're going to take some deep breaths together and just take a moment to take stock of your body and how you're feeling any areas of tension. Just release the tension when you exhale. Let's deep breathe in. Deep breath out. Deep breath in and out. And in a moment, our meditation music will begin. And when it does, I'll stay with you and we will for a few moments to help you position yourself into this meditation. Deep breath in. And out. In. And out. Just maintain those deep breaths. Not forced, but just long and slow. Now I want you to think about a time in your life that may have brought you emotional trouble. A moment that likes to remind itself, remind you of itself. Start to picture the surroundings, some of the faces, the people that you interacted with, maybe even the type of clothing that you wore. Picturing yourself at that time. And 
And for whatever mistakes you made, for whatever choices you made, whatever happened to you, however you responded, I want you to now, in the next 20 minutes, spend time showing yourself compassion and mercy. Saying to yourself things like, it's okay, you were steeped in ignorance, or you didn't know any better, or these circumstances were completely out of your control. Be kind to yourself. So let's do that for the next 20 minutes. Remember to keep breathing in and out. And when other thoughts that aren't related to this exercise come into your mind, just gently turn your attention back to the meditation object and then to offering yourself compassion.
continue to hang on to the meditation a little while longer, please. Just deep breaths in. And just have these thoughts in your mind. I'd like you to be safe. I'd like you to be healthy. And I'd like you to be happy. And I want you to be at ease in the world. Saying that to your past self, I'd like to be, I'd like you to be safe. I'd like you to be healthy. I'd like you to be happy. I'd like you to be at ease in the world. And out. Why don't you slowly open up your eyes and get acclimated to your surroundings. Just take your time. If you need to be in that moment for just a little bit longer, it's, it's fine. It takes time and effort to be able to show yourself compassion. Showing yourself compassion for probably some what, what are some very difficult circumstances. For me, in my 20s and 30s, I went through a lot of religious trauma. And it was really, sub it was really subtle. It wasn't like blatant, overt trauma and abuse. It was all very subtle and it was very manipulative a lot of herd mentality, a lot of peer pressure, but not like high school peer pressure, more like this unspoken peer pressure. Like if I don't do this or act the same way or be the same way that I'm not going to be, I'm not going to fit in. I'm not going to be accepted. And it's still a work in progress showing myself compassion for those, those times and showing myself understanding and empathy. So I want you to be able to do the same thing for yourself, but know that it's just gonna take time for some of those memories and some of those things to work them out, to show yourself kindness and compassion in the midst of those times in your life. <clears throat> All right. This morning we're going to be reading from Letters from a Stoic by Seneca, and this is letter number seven. You ask me to say what you should consider it particularly important to avoid. My answer is this, a mass crowd. It is something to want, or it is something to which you cannot entrust yourself yet without risk. I, at any rate, am ready to confess my own frailty in this respect. I never come back home with quite the same moral character I went out with. Something or other becomes unsettled where I had achieved internal peace. Some one or some other of the things I had put to flight reappears on the scene. We who are recovering from a prolonged spiritual sickness are in the same condition as invalids who have been affected by, to such an extent by prolonged indisposition that they cannot once be taken out of doors without ill effects. Associating with people in large numbers is actually harmful. 
There is not one of them that will not make some vice or other attractive to us, or leave us carrying the imprint of it, or be daubed uh, with unawares with it. And inevitably enough, the larger the size of the crowd we mingle with, the greater the danger. But nothing is as ruinous to the character as sitting away one's time at a show. In this context, they're probably talking about the gladiatorial shows in ancient Rome. For it is then through the medium of entertainment that vice creeps into one with more than unusual ease. What do you want to take me? Uh, what do you take me to mean? That I go home more selfish, more self-seeking, and more self-indulgent? Yes. And what is more, a pr person crueler and less humane through having been in contact with human beings. I happen to go to one of those, <clears throat> one of these shows at the time of the launch hour, uh, the lunch hour interlude expecting there to be some light and witty entertainment then some respite for the purpose of affording people's eyes a rest from human blood far from it all the earlier contests were charity in comparison the nonsense dispense with now what we have now <clears throat> is murder pure and simple. The combatants have nothing to protect them. Their whole bodies are exposed to the blows. Every thrust they launch gets home. A great many spectators prefer this to the ordinary matches and even to the special popular demand ones. And quite naturally, there are no helmets and no shields repelling the weapons. What is the point of armor or of skill? All that sort of thing just makes the death slower incoming. In the morning, men are thrown to the lions and the bears, but it's the spectators that are thrown to in the lunch hour. The spectators insist that each unkilling his man shall be thrown against another to be killed in his turn, and the eventual victor is reserved by them for some other form of butchery. The only exit for the contestants is death. Fire and steel keep the slaughter going. And all this happens while the arena is virtually empty. But he was a highway robber. He killed a man. And what of it? Granted that a murderer has deserved this punishment, what have you done, you wretched fellow, to deserve to watch it? Kill him, flog him, burn him. Why does he run at the other man's weapon in such a cowardly way? Why isn't he less half-hearted about killing? Why isn't he a bit more enthusiastic about, about, about dying? Whip him forward to get his wounds. Make them each offer the, the other a bare breast and trade blow for blow on them. And when there is an interval in the show... Let's have some throats cut on the meantime, so what? So that there's something happening. Come now, I say. Surely you people realize, if you realize nothing else, that bad examples have a way of recoiling on those who set them. Give thanks to the immortal gods, to the man to whom you are giving a lesson in cruelty, are not in a position to profit from it. Let me pause there for a moment. I think there are some correlations and parallels to um, the the gladiatorial days of Rome and and like even thinking about reality TV nowadays, how we like to take pleasure in people's misery or pain or inconvenience or you know there's a certain sense of judgment like oh at least i'm not that bad 
So there's a little bit of that in here, a little bit of a parallel. So we're really not that different from the ancient Romans in a way. I'll continue. When a mind is impressionable and has none too firm a hold on what is right, it must be rescued from the crowd. It is so easy for it to go over to the majority. A Socrates, a Cato, or a Laelius might have been shaken in his principles by a multitude of people different from himself. Such is the measure of the inability of any of us even as we even as we perfect our personalities adjustment to withstand the onset of vices when they come with such a mighty following a single example of extravagance or greed does a lot of harm an intimate who leads a pampered life gradually makes one soft and flabby a wealthy neighbor provokes cravings in one. A, a companion with a malicious nature tends to rub off some of his rust, even on someone of an innocent and open-hearted nature. What then do you imagine the effect on a person's character is when the assault comes from the world at large? You inevitably either hate or imitate the world. But the right thing to shun both courses. You should neither become like the bad because they are many, nor be an enemy of the many because they are unlike you. Retire into yourself as much as you can. Associate with people who are likely to improve you. Welcome those whom you are capable of improving. The process is a mutual one. Men learn as they teach. And there is no reason why any pride in advertising your talents abroad should lure you forward into the public eye, inducing you to give readings of your works or deliver lectures. I should be glad to see you doing that if you had to offer them was suitable for the crowd I've been talking about. But the fact is, not one of them is really capable of understanding you. You might perhaps come across one here and there, but even they would need to be trained and developed by you to a point where they could grasp your teaching. For whose benefit then did I learn it all? If it was for your own benefit, then you learnt it you have no call to fear that your trouble may have been wasted. Just to make sure that I have not been leaning, learning solely for my own benefit today, let me share with you three fine quotations I have come across, each concerned with something like the same idea. One of them is by way of payment of the usual debt so far as this letter is concerned. And the other two are to regard as an advancement on account. To me, says Democritus, a single man is a crowd, and a crowd is a single man. Equally good is the answer given by the person, whoever it was, his identity is uncertain, who when asked, what was the object of all the trouble he took over a piece of craftsmanship when it would never reach more than a very few people replied? A few is enough for me. So is one, and so is none. Let me repeat that, phrase, that whole sentence again. Equally good is the answer given by the person, whoever it was, who when asked... What was the object of all the trouble he took over a piece of craftsmanship when it would never reach more than a very few people replied, a few is enough for me. So is one and so is none. The third is a nice expression I used by Epicurus in a letter to one of his colleagues. I am writing this, he says, 
not for the eyes of the many, but for yours alone. For each of us is audience enough for the other. Lay these up in your heart, my dear Lucilius, that you may scorn the pleasure that comes from the majority's approval. The many speak highly of you, but have you really any grounds for satisfaction? Let me try that again. The many speak highly of you, but have you really any grounds for satisfaction with yourself? If you are the kind of person the many understand, your merits should not be outward facing. And that is our leader, or our letter for the day, letter number seven. <laughs> hey, May, why don't you catch the VOD? I think you will benefit from the mor this morning's meditation. We had a different focus this morning. We tried a different form of meditation. I had nearly slept in too, just to be clear. Not to excuse myself, but I had a really rough sleep last night. I, I, was, I did stay up late and played video games with my son for a while. Or more accurately, I played FIFA 2015. That's how old the game is. And he watches. He loves to watch me play FIFA on the Xbox. And he likes to do color commentary. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's mildly amusing. But we stayed up to like midnight doing that. And I slept for like only three hours. And then I was like up constantly. Finally, by about 4 or 4.30, um, by about 4.30, I just had it. I was so wide awake. So I came down to my studio space here started messing with my guitar tone and I've got a guitar rack pedal unit that I'm working on setting up for the dark side of the moon experience. And so I putzed with that for like an hour and a half until and played around with guitar solos and stuff. And then finally went back to bed and slept for two hours and then got up for meditation. So yeah, I'm not going to stream today. I'm tired. I'm going to probably go back to bed for a half an hour, hour, just to get a little bit more sleep. And then I'm spending the day, the entire day, working up, practicing and rehearsing the Dark Side of the Moon album. Um, good morning, Nine. It's nice to see you. Um, so... While that might be fun for a very select few people, mostly myself, um, I don't, I don't understand <laughs> the joy and fascination that people get derived from watching someone practice. I, I don't understand that very much. Though, I, well, I understand it a tiny bit. Like there is a. Um, pianist that I've watched and all she ever does on her stream is rehearse. She doesn't do performances or anything like that. She's a professional pianist from uh, I forget where. Her name is Olga Sheps and she's a professional pianist. She plays all the time with orchestras and stuff like that and so I guess watching I guess watching a real pro do their work, you know, can be pretty mesmerizing for the weekend warriors and amateurs out there. But I can't imagine people being interested in watching me rehearse the same damn songs for eight hours. <laughs> I'm a real pro. <laughs> Thanks, Nine. <laughs> You're very kind. You are very kind. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but I'm not sure I'm going to stream because... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> what Nine said. But 
I encourage you if you if you just snuck in at the tail end here and you missed the morning meditation, I do encourage you to um, go back and watch the VOD when you've got a good half an hour to yourself. Um, or in nine's case, if you have five minutes to yourself. <laughs> no, seriously, I, um, I encourage you to go through it because I'm going through the same process of, um, of trying to find healing and restoration for the past. Um, so this morning, our guided meditation time, instead of the normal focusing on breathing and just practicing mindfulness, we actually practiced setting aside some time to dig into our past, into things that, you know, trouble us, things that kind of like to come up and remind us of themselves, of that moment in our life. And then just moments that go, oh, go away. So this morning, we kind of resurfaced some of those things and spent time meditating on showing ourselves compassion and kindness in those times. Whether it was an event steeped in our own ignorance or things that were done to us or just bad choices that we made because we didn't know any better, um, whatever it may be, I think it's important to once in a while show yourself some kindness and compassion. And, and to be fair, I need to do this to my, for myself all the time. And you're right. You're right, May. I do need to give myself credit. Um, um, it's very easy for myself to go, oh, God, you're just so awful, dude. Stolas, you suck can't get you've been working on this guitar solo for like five hours and you still can't get it right <laughs> but um it's it's true we all need to show ourselves kindness and compassion and give ourselves more credit so <sighs> so do that we are our own worst critics it's it's right it's true, but I do encourage you to, if you missed the meditation, go back and spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes meditating on your life. And I just, all I did is I started with a moment in my life. So I, I chose to focus on moments in my life that were steeped in religious trauma and manipulation and spiritual abuse and stuff like that and i picked one moment started showing myself kindness and compassion and saying things mentally to myself like i were there and then just kind of let the memories drift into different moments in those times and seeing the different faces of people that either were really kind to me or really manipulative, even in the most benign, seemingly benign ways, you know, maybe they had, had very innocent intentions, but really steeped in manipulation and coercion and, um, and just general unspoken peer pressure to be a certain way. You know, you, and May, I'm not saying you have to do that. This this happened to be my area of focus. I'm just saying that if there's something else in your life, the, even if it's just something that's seemingly small, just start with something small. You know, maybe you said something stupid to someone or maybe you did something. I'm just saying find a time in your life where your knee-jerk reaction is to criticize yourself and interrupt that moment and show yourself kindness and compassion in that that's all i'm that's all we did this morning is and i probably didn't set it up adequately enough but that's effectively what this morning's meditation was about is going back into a moment doesn't have to be serious and hardcore like I did. 
it's really just finding a moment that where you're like, oh, Stolas, you're such a dick back there. Jeez. And stopping that language and interrupting it and going, you know, Stolas, it's okay. You, you didn't know any better. You were younger. You were foolish. You were driven by the crowd. And just show yourself kindness and compassion. Just say positive things to you. Say things that are affirming and understanding. Not necessarily um, justifying everything that had been said and done. And not necessarily judging it either. But just saying, you know what? You are a part of the universe and you were misled. You were ignorant. You're still learning and growing and developing as a human being, as a part of the universe. And it's okay. You made a lot of mistakes. We all do. And, and I'm choosing to learn from them and to become the best version of myself today in this moment that I can be. So that's our morning meditation. And I hope you enjoyed it. And our reading from Epic or a reading from Seneca as well. It was a little harsh at the beginning because it talked a lot about the gladiatorial scene in Rome. But if you stop and think about it and ponder it, it really isn't that much different from, say, the reality TV scene now. Because the reality TV scene is, in my view, no different than the people, the commoners that would come and watch in the Colosseums, the slaughter of human beings. It's so all watching the other human beings suffer <laughs> and calling that entertainment. So it's... It's a good read. It's it's a little bit of a struggle through, to get through, but um, there's some really good nuggets in there about steer clear of the crowd because it does have an effect on you. Good. Good for you, Nine. I would, quite honestly, I would steer away from any television programming. But particularly um, reality TV. Because it's all manipulation. There's nothing. <laughs> well, all right. Maybe, maybe not all television, but a lot of it is. It does depend. It is circumstantial. And I'm not going to make a an overarching sweeping judgment about TV, but, but a lot of the programming is really not that is really not that beneficial. And that's kind of what Seneca is talk, talk, talking about in this particular letter, letter number seven, he's talking really about, listen, when you start mingling with a lot of people that, are different from yourself and don't hold the same ideals that shit can rub off on you and so it's really important to make sure that you do retreat from the masses from the crowds from the tv from the social media whatever it may be and find your inner serenity find your peace find your find your center be grounded in the present moment and keep your focus on leading and living a virtual life. Um, Samuel Beckett, that name rings a bell. Is that the playwright? There was a play I saw, and I don't know if his name was Beckett. I think his name was... Um, there was a play I saw in high school. Um, it was a, it was a two person play and it was two guys. The setting was the end of the world, basically the post apocalyptic thing, but there are two guys that live together waiting for Godot. I'll have to look that up. 
But um, one guy was blind and um, he was blind and very intelligent. He was kind of the brains of the operation of these of this group. The other was um, gosh, I wonder if this is the same play. Let me take a look at this. I'm looking at. No, this might be a different play. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if they have a lot of similar influences. But anyways, this play, so you got the one guy who's blind and he's totally with it. He's very intelligent. He's, he's got his, all his faculties. The other guy is, um, can see, but he is purely mad. He's like, he's has, you know, just an inability to speak and act normally. And so, um, so it's about the two of these trying to process and communicate together about the outside world and, and the, the tension of the relationship. And like, so the blind guy wants to know what's going on out in the world. And, and the, the guy who actually can see has really no way of communicating. I might be, um, I think that sounds familiar. Endgame does. Yes. Yes, that's it. Endgame. So yeah, it is the same playwright, Samuel Beckett. That was a really good play. I saw that my senior year in high school and I read, read the play for our English literature class. And um, very, very interesting. I, it really had me intrigued and it really was jostling as well. Because, you know, in high school, you're kind of pretty naive about a lot of things. And then it's like, oh, wow. Really, it was really profound. But I'm going to check out this waiting for waiting for Godot that that sounds like that's right up my alley too well I have a day ahead of me I bet you do too um, so before I go um, make sure that you spend time today being kind and compassionate to yourself be kind and compassionate to those around you and to those you encounter because they're probably having just as a hard of time. But thanks for being here. Thanks for joining me in morning meditation and for our reading from Stoic philosophy. Um, yeah, <laughs> I know it's the, f the fine arts. The fine arts are always are generally worth it, especially if they cause you to go cause you to think and reflect I think that's where there's actual value in television programming if it's just mindless entertainment some once in a while it's okay but but really it behooves us to be really engaged mentally in things so well I am gonna go take a short rest and then I'm gonna practice guitar solos and keyboard parts for eight hours. You guys have a fantastic day. Be kind to yourself. Be compassionate to your friends and even those who are different from you. You can catch morning meditation here every Monday through Friday, starting at 7.30 a.m. Central Time, 0 or 12.30 UTC. We also do studio sessions every Tuesday and Thursday at 7.30 or 7 a.m. No, not 7 a.m. 7 p.m. Central Time Zero TC. And, of course, the Relay Station every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. Central Zero TC. Thanks for being here. Um, have yourself a wonderful weekend. And thanks for being here, friends. I love you very much. <laughs>